Still nothing on your radar? Still no hits at all, Mr. Code. All right, we'll split here. The main power core is down that hall. Be careful and good luck. All right, now that I'm alone in the dark, no sounds or anyone to distract me from my search, it's a perfect time to review some comics, obviously, right? Our story takes place at the castle now converted prison from the return of Queen Chrysalis arc as the main six inspect the Queen's imprisonment. The first minor issue I have with the comic is the presence of all six girls. Twilight and Spike going makes sense because she's a princess of friendship who defeated her. Spike can take notes and moderate the situation, and if anything goes awry in the inspection, Spike can just send a letter to Celestia. The rest of the main six really don't contribute anything to the plot, they pretty much just provide side jokes or commentary on the ensuing events. Take this scene where Rarity references a recent date she had. It's kind of funny, but again, it lasts too long and the plot just stops for a whole page. As for Chrysalis, she ain't looking so good. Once again, Andy Price makes some awesome artwork and he must love drawing Chrysalis because he does a phenomenal job drawing her throughout this comic. The facial expressions are all highly detailed, the shadows and the cross hatching give this comic a legitimately creepy and dark atmosphere, and plenty of nightmare fuel to boot. The dialogue between Twilight and Chrysalis yields a lot of witty and fun banter, but what's most interesting is that despite the queen being locked in a prison, her delivery and eerily calm personality ironically foreshadow how much more in control of the conversation she is rarely reacting angrily and merely shrugging out the main six's commentary about her. We'll come back to that later. And what follows is a very interesting anthology of Chrysalis's past exploits and rise to power, starting off with her conquering the Pegasi city of Timbuktu. Like in the Sirens comic, it's always refreshing to see ancient equestrian in a more Greek-Roman aesthetic, from buildings to attire, giving the world some cool culture insight into its past. One of my favorite aspects of this comic are all the references to Greek mythology, such as the leader of Timbuktu, King Orion. In Greek mythology, Orion is able to walk on water, which is akin to his and other Pegasi's ability to walk on clouds. Mythology Orion was a giant and a great hunter, and as we see in the ensuing battle with Chrysalis's minions, he demonstrates his finesse with a spear and his ability to combat groups of changelings. And while there are different legends surrounding the death of Orion, one states that he was killed by a scorpion, and King Orion essentially has his soul sucked out by an insectoid creature, but he escapes and he flees his conquered city quite literally to the stars, a clever allegory for death and the star constellation Orion. The first story really establishes an interesting introspective to her cunning and brutal nature, and even where she got her crown. Our next story is The Siege of the Tra, a parody of the fall of Troy, Trojan horse and all. Interesting side note about our emperor here, Inciatus is also the name of the Roman emperor Caligula's most beloved horse. Oh great, am I gonna have to review the MLP equivalent of Caligula now? That means it's gonna be an orgy with a stallion that has an ass on his chest. <sighs> anyway, we also get a glimpse of the first anti-changeling shield, which not only shows the long-standing conflict Equestrians had with changelings, but also establishes how Chrysalis infiltrated Cantala, since she's already experienced how that magic works in the past. Also, I love the badass armor that Chrysalis wears during the attack, and just like her conquest of Timbuktu, we get a short but awesome battle scene. Once again, I do like how Katie Cook throughout this anthology plays with the original Greek mythology stories, making them fun and interesting interpretations. For example, Troy's downfall in letting the Trojan horse enter the city was by fear of the gods, while the Trot's downfall was brought on by vanity and idiocy, which was hilarious. Though probably the weakest of the anthology, only because some of Chrysalis's dialogue sometimes sounds Sounds a little too much uh, cliche cartoon henchman bickering, temporarily losing that imitation, but nothing too character breaking. We also get some interesting insight on the queen's priorities in the second interlude, putting her changelings in hibernation mode and preserving their energy, showing that she does possess empathy for her kind and the survival of her race, so it's some nice character development showing that she's not a complete cunning monster of deception and has fears and doubts. Our next story picks up with Chrysalis banished in a volcano prison by Luna and Celestia. This is the parody of the Iliad and the Odyssey, more specifically Odysseus trapped in the cave with a Cyclops Polyphemus. Here, the queen contends with a dragon and she uses her cunning and flattery, much like Odysseus, to escape her tormentor. Uh, not much else to say on this story, but it was a fun, interesting adaptation of the Odyssey, showing more of her ingenuity and her sly nature. Chrysalis even agrees to tell her origin story in exchange for Twilight entering her prison, giving her a book, and she actually goes along with this. Oh dear. Twilight, you literally just listened to Chrysalis entertain everyone with her past exploits, including using stealth, deception, and lies to conquer nations in a hostile takeover. You think she's not gonna try that again, even in her current condition? Twilight even had a book outlining all of her previous crimes in explicit detail. Even Fluttershy's against the idea. And guess what? Surprise, cockpit! She does trick her. 
Though, admittedly, it was a pretty clever setup I didn't see coming. Disguising herself as a clone and acting so calm and collected throughout the comic, she really sold her defeated nature. Though, how the hell did she set this up? Was she just waiting for Twilight to show up or just some idiot guard to enter? The plan seemed to hitch entirely on Twilight's empathy. Chrysalis' actual origin is actually pretty cool, growing from a seed and becoming a cross hybrid with some kind of cicada, and of course, more nightmare fuel. And we end the comic with Chrysalis taking off with her army in tow. Despite the questionable decision at the end, this is actually a pretty good comic. It's interesting to see Chrysalis' past showing her to be the devious, intimidating creature that she's become, and in the process giving us a fair amount of world building. References to Greek mythology made for some interesting adaptations of the classic stories, and Andy Price once again makes some more awesome artwork. And overall, the Fiendship series has been a mixed bag. Summer Story had a fun, dark, but sympathetic backstory. The Tyrant comic was just bland and boring. The Sirens comic was dumb and silly. Nightmare Moon was an absolute mess. And the Chrysalis comic was pretty good, despite some minor dialogue problems and the presence of all the main six. And of course, the ending. Not the best comic, but still very entertaining. Well, that's it. Finally conquered the Fiendship series. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have an entity to find. Damn it. Judge?